yourself with. So much so that this book, The Green Consumer Guide, is currently number one of the non-fiction paperback bestsellers. And we've got Julia Hales with us, who is one of the authors of it. And Julia Hales, who's the co-author of The Green Consumer Guide. In a moment, we'll be talking to environmentalist Julia Hales. Well, we're joined now by environmentalist Julia Hales. Good morning to you, Julia. Good morning. Um, joined this morning by Julia Hales, um, who's an environmentalist and author of The Green Consumer Guide. And on to now, The Late Show. I think the Green Consumer is a reality. I think when we first thought of the Green Consumer, and John Elkington actually conceived the idea in 1986, at that stage he didn't know whether the Green Consumer existed. It's something that has begun to exist. There are people who are going out there and they are buying one product over another on the basis of its environmental acceptability. Joining me are John Elkington, co-author of The Green Consumer Guide. Green consumerism was actually meant to make some of the green message rather more palatable. And when we started, I must say, most people advised us not to use green, not to touch it with a barge pole, because it was actually unacceptable. People didn't want to go back and live in wigwams in Wales. What about the argument that it's a middle-class fad and that green is a whole load of hocus, hocus pocus? I think there are very few people who think that green is a hocus pocus. I think most people uh, realise that green and environmental issues are absolutely key. Is it trendy to be green yet or is it still regarded as a rather elite sort of green welly type of affair? Well, I think people are definitely changing their perceptions because um, when I first started working as an environmentalist, they definitely I was being challenged as sort of being a freak for a very long time, whereas now, suddenly, um, people are not only are not sort of stereotyping you in the same way, they're sort of thinking, bringing up their sort of key issue and sort of thinking that you must be very topical to, to be vital. green. It's been a wonderful green yeah. week, Julia, for you, hasn't it? Um, excellent green week. I mean, the, the, the papers I thought were full of not very much, but masses on, on green issues, which is quite exciting. Murray recently did a poll which showed that 42% um, of adult Britons had actually chosen between products on the basis of their environmental performance this year. That compared with 19% last year. We've had more than a doubling in less than a year. I think that that is an enormously important um, transition because what you're getting is people beginning to make choices and in making choices, having to think about the issue. Have you looked at uh, any of the lesser tabloids? If we start the um, Sunday Express, I don't know if that counts the lesser tabloid, but it is quite interesting that those sort of papers are really covering green issues in a, in a very, fairly major way, whereas, in fact, um, as you said, in about six months ago, you wouldn't have seen them going near it. Um, a green consumer is someone who actually chooses the products and actually looks at what effect that product might have on the environment and goes to the one that is more environmentally friendly than the alternative. There isn't any product that is actually good for the environment. It all has some sort of environmental impact. So what we're looking at is trying to decrease that environmental impact and trying to get products to change to use less energy or less resources and, and look at what happens when it goes into the waste stream. We're beginning to get those sort of changes from the manufacturers and, and retailers and therefore people have much more of a choice about what they can do. With environmentally friendly products, some would increase in price if they all became environmentally friendly and others wouldn't because they would benefit from the economies of scale. But one of the ironies that I've uh, spotted in the paper this morning is that in the Mail on Sunday they've got a, a competition for a green kitchen which in fact I organised at the um, along with Friends of the Earth and at the same time in the supplement here we've got um, an advertisement for a mahogany kitchen which has to be really dreadful because mahogany is the wood from the rainforest and uh, is encouraging the destruction of the rainforest to buy tropical timber. What to upsets me most is it's a really nasty looking kitchen as well. And if you're going to chop down the most beautiful rainforest and create something really disgusting in its place, it's really a very... You're, <laughs> you're right. It's very significant that the individual in the UK can actually do um, to, to recognise the problem of the rainforest by not buying timber that comes from those okay. sources. Well, as far as habitat is concerned, we have now said that we will no longer uh, import or use any endangered tropical hardwoods in any of our furniture products. It's a small step, but nonetheless we felt that we are caring in the environment, in the home environment, so therefore it should extend to the world environment. Is that enough, do you think, Julia? You were kind of looking, I don't know whether it was agreement or well, it's, it's, distaste. It's, it's, um, I just wanted to use that as an example of the sort of thing that consumers can do and initiate, because if they are actually saying they don't want to buy tropical hardwoods, which come from the rainforest, companies like Habitat um, will actually be saying, well, we don't want to stock it. And that produces great pressure on the governments and the people who are supplying that tropical timber. Elizabeth, what's, what's the most invisible? important thing? I want to know, what's the most important thing, single thing we can do to help preserve the environment or I deal with pollution? The most important thing you can do is to use your shopping power to actually buy more environmentally friendly products and, and actually boycott the ones that are damaging to the environment. And by that, you can encourage 
energy efficiency, cleaner water, and a, and a lot of these things. It's not the only solution, but it's certainly something that everybody can participate in. We're not in. powerless. You can help. You can have a hand in your own destiny. Take it. See you in the morning. Thank you. And the whole thrust of greenery, I think you probably agree, sort of started with the Prime Minister's speech last October. No, and I think it started about um, a month before when we had Green Consumer Week. Yeah. <laughs> Quite right. So we're not merely friends of the earth, we are its guardians and trustees for generations to come. No generation has a freehold on this earth. All we have is a life tenancy with a full repairing lease. Tomorrow is Britain's first green shopping day. You can't have failed to have noticed that today is green shopping day. Today is green shopping day. It's green shopping day. Demonstrating their support for green shopping day. Green shopping day was the brainchild of Julia Hales, co-author of the new green shopping guide published this week. Being a green consumer raises your awareness about the impact of particular products on the environment. And if you're aware of those, you might well consider giving them up. Equally well, what green consumerism does is it encourages greater energy efficiency, less packaging, consideration about the resources that are put into particular products. People are trying to make changes to appeal to the green consumer and the commercial incentives that that brings them. Today is Green Shopping Day, an event which aims to alert shoppers to green issues in the high street. It coincides with the publication of the Green Consumers Supermarket Shopping Guide, a book which aims to give consumers the lowdown on where to do their food shopping in the most environmentally friendly fashion. It's not just the supermarkets that are looking and seeing the commercial incentives that green consumerism presents. Um, the manufacturers are, are, are realising the same benefits. But that in itself is the motivation, and at least if, the, if they're following that motivation, at least they are making improvements towards their effect on the environment, and that's what really matters at the end of the day. It's green shopping day, but just how green are our grocers? Well, if you've been to your supermarket this morning or seen the adverts in today's newspapers, you can't have failed to have noticed that today is green shopping day. Everyone, it seems, wants to be seen to be green. As manufacturers and retailers scramble aboard the green bandwagon. Being green has never been so fashionable, and whether it's petrol or potatoes, big business is falling over itself to produce goods which are environment friendly. Caring for the environment, is it uh, for cranks or is it now big business? What a lot of people are unaware of is exactly how their consumer purchases affect the environment and the fact that even within uh, a normal supermarket you do have a choice and you can make a significant contribution. Today, what a lot of people are unaware of is exactly how their consumer purchases affect the environment and the fact that even within uh, a normal supermarket you do have a choice and you can make a significant contribution demonstrating their support for Green Shopping Day. Motoring organisations joined in too, offering free conversions of car engines to lead-free petrol. In the shops, one supermarket chain with its own range of environment-friendly detergents said sales were five times higher than expected, that most supermarkets are already planning to expand the range of environment-friendly products on their shelves. Those choices, and that's what we're trying to do with Green Shopping Day. We're trying to make people more aware of the choices that are there and to show people that people who've been shopping as green consumers over the last year have had some effect because there are more products available for the green consumer around on the shelves today than there was a year ago. Tomorrow is Britain's first green shopping day aimed at making customers more aware of the range of environmentally friendly goods on sale. What we're trying to do is encourage the already fierce competition that there is between the supermarkets to be the most environment friendly because we recognise the supermarkets do exist and they are there and they are a place where the majority of people go shopping. Tesco, now billed as the greener grocer, is confident that it can nurture and control the new breed of green consumer. In this country, the best people to do anything about anything are the supermarkets because we're the ones who get to the public. The Green Consumer Guide published this week has surveyed British supermarkets to discover how many of their products are environmentally acceptable. The greenest stores, which get four stars, are Safeway and Sainsbury, and Marks and Spencer just one. There's been a, a very rapid development over the last year. If you looked at the supermarkets at the beginning of last year, you'd probably have found very little response in terms of environmental policy. Are there any other reasons why they're suddenly jumping on this bandwagon? Well, I think the, uh, the concept of the green consumer has, began, uh, has begun to engage right through the sector, from the consumer to the retailer and the manufacturer. I've just come back from Hong Kong where, as you know, a lot of the fashion products uh, are made, manufactured, dyed. They have enormous pollution problems. Uh, factories 
dying rivers blue, red, purple as a result of, of their practices and insufficient legislation to, to, to control it. We tend to work around natural fibres as opposed to sort of too many nylons or acetates or things like that which are possibly polluting, you know, where they're processed they're probably pumping out smoke or something that's not very good for the environment. If you actually went to a dyes and finishers, normal dyes and finishers anywhere at any factory, you'd actually see how much of the dye stuffs and chemicals were actually being put back into the water systems, and it's diabolical. Mambo grew out of the fact that we wanted to sell the truth, and the truth was that the surfers today have to sit in polluted water. In our plant in Sydney, we use a recycling method, whereas a lot of our dyes are recycled and reused, which is, one, cost-effective and economical for us, and two, um, stops a lot of sort of produce just being dumped down into the drains. I've started off in my office more with uh, all my reels of computer paper being recycled. I haven't quite got to the, uh, the dye works yet, but um, we're looking into the whole thing really. The manufacturing procedures are going to change, but that won't be across the board, so it means that the choice is going to be there and it's up, for con up to consumers to make the choice in favour of the environment. All I'm trying to do is do my little bit, as, as any single human being or small company can do. And any real successful lobby will come from the street. It won't actually come from the industry. The industry will, will start it and will be the vehicle. Somebody who's full of sound advice and tips is Julia Hales, author of the Young Green Consumer Guide. Good morning, Julia. Thanks so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Well, with me now is Julia Hales, co-author of this book, The Young Green Consumer Guide, which is full of ideas and information all about green issues. Good morning, Julia. It's good to have you on, on the show. Thanks very much for coming in. Well, what sort of age do you think we should be encouraging our children to be green? Our book is actually aim aimed at an audience from about 8 to 13, but I think you can start being green a lot earlier than that. It's just a question of how much you can do at what stage. And actually, we've done a, a green quiz on sort of how green your home is, so you can go around and investigate and see what you could be doing and score marks out of, um, out of 20 and how well you've done. At using recycled products like recycled paper in your schools and checking out where your pencils are coming from, not using disposable pens, using calculators that actually have uh, a solar powered rather than battery powered. There's endless sort of ideas of things that, that children can do and, and can have effect about. The, the Young Green Consumer Guide, which you've been uh, writing, is very interesting. I had a look through it and it actually tells you all about, um, regarding schools and even homes, how you can do an audit about how green you actually are particularly for, for younger people, but actually it works right across the board, that if you actually get people involved in finding out about the impact of what they're doing either at home or at school or even at work um, and how that affects the environment, it's, it's much easier for people to see what they can do about it. And so in the Young Green Consumer Guide, we've got a whole section which is how to carry out an environmental audit of your school. And we've got the children to look at things like catering and the school grounds and what all happens in their classrooms. It. It's very interesting. So there is actually something all of us can do. Julia Hales, thank you very much for joining us.